Okay, and then if we're able to go to the next slide, um, just a quick update uh, before I hand over to the MedStop team. Um, so in the run up to exams for most years, um, do make sure to, or if you want to have a look at some of the MedSoc resources up on our um, website, um, there's a number of resources, although they're tailored week by week for, for UEA, they're applicable to sort of any um, med course. Um, and there's especially quite a few um, OSCE documents that can be quite useful in the run up to final exams. Um, and we're continuing to, to support uh, MedStop as well. So keep an eye out and, and do follow their Facebook page. Um, and for Scrubs for Norwich um, students, um, there are still a few available, so get in contact if you, you need to do that or, or message the MedSoc team if, if you've got any questions about that. So I won't hold you any longer and I'll hand over to um, the MedSoc team to take you through the next, um, the next event. Hey all, I'm Sarah from the MedStop team. Hopefully you can see and hear me now. Let me know in the chat um, if you can't or if you have any problems at all. And just to say today, there's also other members of the MedStop team that are in the chat. So if you've got any problems, they'll be able to answer any questions. I'll try answer as they go along, but sometimes it's hard to kind of manage it all and keep it moving at pace. Um, we've got quite a lot to cover today. We've got some SVAs. We'll try to go through stuff. So do please, if there's something particularly that you want us to slow down and cover, just message that and feel free to message it privately as well, if you prefer. Um, okay, so today we're focusing on pleurofusions. Um, and we're going to try and think of kind of common ways to approach these, again, focusing on how you interpret investigations and what this kind of tells you, as well as linking that back to the clinical. And we'll also do a bit on ascites and look at kind of some of the common things that go with it a long way. Okay, so first, um, I know we've got a range of year groups, so we're going to try build up, kind of work from the basics and build up. Um, again, if it's older year groups here and they want us to go quicker, just match it. So starting with pleurofusion. So um, there's always, um, we're talking about, um, there's always a little bit of fluid um, between you've got your um, visceral and your prior to pleura of the lungs. And there's a little bit of fluid because if you think about the lungs and how um, the physiology of breathing works is that your lungs are constantly moving up and down. And you want this to be as easy and as least work as possible. So you have a little bit of fluid constantly there to make that easy. And normally this is about 15 milliliters per day. And normally it's a little bit produced and it's a little bit absorbed. Um, have of course, this can go wrong. So when this goes wrong, you can get a buildup of fluid in this place. And it being so linked to the lungs, it can then have problems. Um, and so when we're talking about pleurofusion, we're talking about this buildup of fluid from either a problem, which can either be in more production, or if there's been a problem in um, the reabsorption of this fluid. And it's often more commonly in production. We're going to go through some of those reasons and how you might interpret those now. Um, yeah, so just to start things off with the very basics, um, a quick poll to kind of get what I think this is just probably quite easy for lots of people, but just to kind of really you want to be super familiar, this feeling really confident on this, on what both for clinical practice and because it commonly comes up in SBAs, um, what um, are, um, you know, what you expect to find. So I've just started that poll let me know if, if, if people can't see that and just give that a quick go and I've just kind of tried to put them on try and think about which one would be a pleurofusion and also um which one would um uh like what the others would be as you go through so just give you a minute for that question Yeah, so there's 30 seconds left. Go for it, it's anonymous, so just feel free to go for any and commit so that you remember then whichever way you went. Yeah, and just 15 seconds, 10 seconds left. Five seconds left. Just go for one. Great. Um, so I'll close that poll and I'll just share the results so everyone can kind of see and we'll just talk through that now. So the first thing to say is the first thing that you've been given is a respirate. Again, um, when have we 
been talking for our own central investigations, we always talk about getting familiar, knowing the numbers, owning the numbers. And although observations aren't really kind of investigations that I would really say, you know, they're your friend, they're what you're going to be using when you're called in the night to know how unwell someone is, know them, feel confident. So rest rate, 24, how are we feeling about that? That's high, that's kind of worrying what's going on here. And then we've got, uh, it then tells us about the trachea. So that's whenever we're looking at the trachea, we're thinking about, is there lung volume loss? So it's shifting towards the side or is there having something that is pushing? So increase in volume that is pushing it away to the other side. So in this first case, we've got a tissue essential. We've then got it dull to percussion, but with increased focal resonance. So this is what we're thinking about. This would be our consolidation. So it's really useful to use percussion and vocal resonance as how you differentiate between effusion versus consolidation, which can otherwise seem a little bit similar when you're listening to the chest. And the key differential is if it's consolidation, you've got this dullness to percussion but increase vocal resonance and I always think about there kind of being these blobby things there that make it increase and then um whereas when you've got a effusion you've got dullness dullness and if you remember you've got that stony dullness which is classically used in SBAs but it might not always be there so you need to be comfortable recognizing it with or without that but I think about okay I know pleural effusions is stony dullness I'm just going to remember effusions is dullness to both of those so the first one this is not going to be um a pleural effusion because we've got increased vocal resonance and that's a good reliable sign this is not an effusion um, and then some of our generic signs like um, decreased chest expansion we've also got some crackles so with a pleural effusion if you had like kind of a bilateral um, pleural effusion and you had some upper lobe crackles you might be thinking about heart failure but the kind of crackles that might be also associated if you had a pneumonia which is what's a question a just to recap that's talking about consolidation we know that because we've got increased vocal resonance so we've got a dis disparity between percussion and resonance and then we've got some crackles so if we move on to b we've still got a raised rest rate but a le little bit less high we've got this dullness to percussion we've got decreased um vocal resonance so we're saying that double dullness this is what we're talking about this is your pleural effusion in this case and we've got a trachea central in this case and with pleural effusion you can have the trachea central because if it's only about 300 milliliters we wouldn't be expecting it to shift it because it's not that much fluid but we might be expecting to find some um, findings on examinations if you had a very large pleural effusion you might think find that um, on your chest x-ray that you saw a bit of a midline shift and then if we go to C, um, we've got, um, again, this disparity, dull to percussion, increased vocal resonance. We're thinking about consolidation. And this is just to say that you don't always have to have your crackles there to be thinking about the same. And moving on to D, so we've got resonant to percussion. There's only a couple of things that make things resonant. And one of the things that we're thinking of is air. So we're thinking that there's um, a pneumothorax here. And then the of last one e we've got a trachea deviated towards the side of dullness and we've got what might be a bit confusing here is we've got dullness to percussion and decreased vocal resonance but we've got it deviated towards the side of dullness so we wouldn't expect that with a pleural effusion because that suggests something there's a pressure there's been a loss of volume that has drawn it towards so we'd be expecting that with something like um if we had a collapse of the lung so just gone through those, just as a kind of reminder to make sure that um, you know those really well, you feel really comfortable with those. I hope that's clear. We can revisit the end, the end if not, but just kind of go over those, be really confident, know these inside out. Okay. Um, great. Okay, so um, we talked about bronchial breathing and I said that bronchial breathing you often get with consolidation, but be a bit careful because sometimes if you're at, you've got your pleural effusion, then you've got your level of your pleural effusion. Sometimes there you can get a bit of bronchial breathing. So this is more for, I don't think in SBAs they would put it in, but for in real life, if you hear a bit of bronchial breathing at that level line, don't be put off, it could still be a pleural infusion. And then what, this is just feel free to comment in the chat, I'll write it down. What investigations would you want to do once you've found these examination listening? Okay. And I think what we'd all feel comfortable with, I mean, anyone having anything that you found on listening to the, on listening to the chest, you want to be doing a chest x-ray. It's, you know, if it's easy to do, if they're unwell, you can get it done portable. It's really, I would have, you kind of need a reason not to be doing it in someone who has a raised rest rate that is new if they're in hospital. So always think chest x-ray. We've just got a quick, and we're not going to cover too much on chest x-rays because I feel like they covered quite well in people's courses, but I just want people to be familiar. There's a quick poll um, on just have a look at this chest x-ray and what you think is going on. That's great. People are already answering. I'm hoping this should be easy to so just go for it. And I'm only going to give you another 15 more seconds. 
So 10 seconds left. Great, fantastic. Everyone did fabulous on that. This is a bilateral pleurofusion. In terms of your approaching your chest x-rays, that's always with your, pe some people do the A, B, C, D, E approach. So thinking about the airway and then breathing, looking at the lung fields, cardiac, and then the diaphragm. And of course, this is, we're looking at this and we can see that we've got, you know, this very curved meniscal lines on both sides. It doesn't look clear. And we've also got, it looks like quite an enlarged heart, possibly with some upper lobe diversions. So we've got this bilateral pleurofusion that might be also some signs of heart failure as well. Okay, another one just to keep things moving. And there's another poll I'll try to bring up for you guys um, to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we launch, have a look at this one? Try have a look, this one might be a little bit trickier. And I'll just give you another 15 more seconds. If you want longer on any of these polls, just message in the chat and we can do that. But I'm gonna try to keep things fast moving for everyone. Yeah, so 10 more seconds. Okay, great job. So this one's a bit tricky and we've got a bit more of a span of results. Um, so again, we'd go for our same approach. And what the things that we're looking at is I think everyone would agree on the left side by the heart, we've got this kind of hazy opacity. Um, and this is just to kind of, um, I can't see a very clear meniscal sign on this. And this is just kind of to demonstrate how most pleurofusions are easy to spot, like the one we saw before, but not always. Um, and this is consolidation that we're looking at. Um, and it can sometimes be confusing. So that's why sometimes you need to really look at it. What we can't really see is it's very hazy. We can't see a clear kind of line. It kind of got loss of that heart border a bit. Something is going on. I don't think this would be the kind of question that comes up so much in exams, but just to kind of show you an example, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's harder to see, really have a think, does this fit with a picture of a pleural fusion or does it fit with a picture of consolidation? Okay, and then uh, I'll just relaunch the poll, another one. Cool. Um, hold on one second. Uh, just give you had a little bit of time already to think so I'll just give you 20 seconds of that one what's going on here and it's a lot easier I don't even think we need the full 20 seconds yeah and I'll stop the poll there fantastic um so this is what we're talking about this is a unilateral pleurofusion this is a very obvious one so if we look on that right side we've got the clear kind of um up uh, I would describe it as a homogeneous, homogeneous opacity obscuring the diaphragm and we've got it's got a meniscal appearance as well so that's kind of we're talking about that tilting upwards so that's definitely pleuroeffusion okay so we talked we're happy with what is a pleurofusion how it happens happy that we do a chest x-ray to confirm that's there the other thing to say is we've been looking at posterior anterior chest x-rays while that does show up um large um relative what is large but um does show up pleurofusions doesn't show up smaller ones so the other things that you can think about either in the past they used to do lateral chest x-rays that's less commonly done but ultrasound is even more sensitive to if it was picking up a smaller one um yeah um, okay, so we talked a bit, um, now we're going to talk about what causes a pleurofusion. So um, this slide is kind of focusing, we talked before that it could be either from increased production of fluid or it could be a disruption to removal, which removal is normally done with the um, by the lymph um, system. Um, and then when we're talking about um, what causes it, uh, I think you guys will have heard this terms before in terms of whether it's exudative or transitive. And I always think about exudatives of thinking about local factors that have been altered. So I think about that as inflammation of the lungs with leaky capillaries, rather than a transudative is when we're thinking about systemic factors that have been altered. I'm gonna go through these now. So first talking about a transudate and we're talking about systemic factors. So it's often more likely to be bilateral because if you think it's systemic, why would it specifically affect one side? That can still affect one side. If you're seeing a bilateral, it's much more likely to be a transudate. And the first thing that can happen is we can talk about hydrostatic pressure as a cause. And um, so 
hydrostatic pressure that's just about thinking about if you think that's physiology that's about the pressure of the blood against the vessel wall um, and we often think about increased hydrostatic pressure as being about um, sort of something that might raise your blood pressure and we've got this increased pressure and if you look at this diagram on the right it's just showing so the first one we've got our capillary we've got our hydrostatic pressure and this is just showing that normally it's balanced with our hydrostatic pressure and our oncotic pressure going the opposite way and normally then you've got your 15 mils per day that we talked about if we've got a disruption to this kind of balance between our hydrostatic and oncotic pressure that we might get with something that increases hydrostatic pressure. So anything that increases our blood pressure. So if you think that's classically heart failure, um, then we're getting this disruption and balance between our forces and we're getting fluid being pushed out and a buildup that causes us a pleural effusion. So hydrostatic pressure, thinking blood pressure, thinking things that raise blood pressure. So thinking heart failure, which can be right, can also be left if it's coming together. Less commonly, it can be if we've got superior vena cava syndrome where we're getting obstruction of that, that can put the blood pressure. You can also think about um, other things that cause elevated pressure. So think about elevated portal pressure, thinking about cirrhosis. And then there's some less common causes, but I think the main ones to be really thinking about when we think about hydrostatic, pre hydrostatic pressure is heart failure. And then also thinking about portal pressure as well. Okay, so that's hydrostatic pressure, what's oncotic pressure. So that's um, a fluid retention force, thinking about the physiology. Um, and it's due to basically being about the amount of protein and um, that can't move that's in there and the force that's pulling water back in. So normally um, you've got um, it balanced. But again, if you've got anything that causes a decrease in osmotic pressure, which is basically linking back to a protein, anything that reduces albumin or protein, then again, if you see the diagram on the right, we get this disruption and we're getting a pure effusion that's transitative. And things that might cause this is that you just need to remember, I think oncotic pressure, I think protein, I think things that lose protein, nephrotic syndrome would be an example, but anything that causes low protein. Okay. Um, do we have any questions so far? Um, just look, having a look. Does that make sense so far? People happy with the speed? Tell me to speed up if they'd like, or any questions in the chat. I don't think we've got any different questions, so we'll continue to move on. So the other way we can get it is a translate is we've got, we're talking about, we've got this um, cavity that we've got flu pleural fluid building up. But if we've also got free fluid in the peritoneal cavity, you know, they're all near, we can get kind of, um, it can move from one cavity to another. So things that think about put cavity, we can have iatrogenic, iatrogenic. So if we're thinking if someone's on peritoneal dialysis, getting a lot of fluid going in their peritoneal cavity, it can make sense how then you could also sometimes get some going into getting increase in um, your pleural space as well. Um, and then if you've got Meg syndrome, which is rare, but comes up sometimes. And that's where you've got that link to, um, if you've got, it's a benign ovarian cancer, um, can sometimes cause you to have a pleural effusion. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of one to know and be aware of. But the most common ones for transudate um, are what we talked about before. So if we've got hydrostatic forces, heart failure, possibly cirrhosis, or we've got our oncotic, and we're thinking about nephrotic syndrome. So those are your, um, transudates. Now onto your exudates. So exudate, we talked about local factors, much more likely to be one-sided. And I think about it as local information of the pleura. And if you look at this diagram, I tried to show that. So on the left, again, we've got this normal, um, how it should normally be working. And in the right image, if you see, we've got some, I demonstrated that we've got a leaky because we've got information and information we know from pathology that causes a leaky membrane when we get this leaky membrane it means that we're getting a pleural effusion and we're getting fluid leaking out to increase that but if you notice we're also getting more protein leaking out and we also might be getting if there's anything else that's also coming to the area so we might be getting more white cells or anything else that is moving in our exudate and the common things for exudative is if you've got an ongoing pneumonia at the same time so paranumonic TB, malignancy, PE, or autoimmune. So all of the kind of common things if you're thinking about your seven things to rule out in respiratory situations. And the other thing is, while it can also, um, impaired clearance can also be a mechanism. Okay, so I put up a summary slide here. I'll just leave that up for a second. So these are the very common, less common, just get an idea. So if you're looking for just kind of, if this is all new to you, I would focus on just learning the very common. If you've heard this all before and trying to take it, add layer up information is the best way to remember. Try and think, write down a couple of the less common ones as well. I'm trying to remember those. And just I'll give everyone first seconds. If you want any, ask any questions at this point, you're more than welcome to.
Okay. Um, just to also draw your attention that we've got some in our exudates, some other things in our less common. So post coronary artery bypass, you can also, and with pancreatitis and perisomai. And if you think these are quite, um, these make people very systemically unwell, it makes sense that you get some disruption. Okay, so how do we investigate? We've We've had a person come in with our respiratory science at the beginning. We've done a chest x-ray. We've decided that we think there is a pure effusion. We want to know what is going on, investigate further. How do we do this? So um, we do this with thoracosynthesis. I really recommend at some point in your time in medical school to try get to see this because um, you just remember things so much better and you'll also be able to see the fluid coming out. And that's one of the things first thing to kind of think about before you're even sending it off to the laboratory. When you see it come out, you're going to get a little bit of a sense, though inaccurate because it's we, otherwise, why do we have all the lab tests? of what might be going on here and you're often if you see it with a clinician who'll do it you'll kind of see them and afterwards they might say you know if they were worried about malignancy and then they um do this um for acrocentesis and they see a blood tinge um a very much blood coming out they say actually that is quite worrying they won't tell the patient then because we'll wait for we have confirmed information but you kind of start to get a sense of what what is worrying what isn't so um when we've got it um, bloody, we already mentioned, what does that make you think of? So um, that could be um, with um, malignancy, um, but also could sometimes be, you can get a little bit from traumatic as well. Um, or if you've got a pneumonia, you can get a little bit of blood. It all depends on the amount. So you might think about sending if you were worried, if it looked quite bloody for hematocrit. And if you're getting more than 50%, um, that's kind of significant and for a hemothorax. Um, then you want to be looking at the colour. If it's particularly kind of white and milky, you're thinking, is, it, is this, you know, a like chylophorex? Is it lymph? Is it got high level of triglycerides? You also want to have a bit of a think about odour. And whenever something really smells really bad, you're always thinking of a really nasty infection. So you always want to make sure that you're sending for not just aerobic cultures, but anaerobic. So that, and that applies to not just pleurofusions, anything, you know, if you're ever taking, um, even if you're just seeing um, a, uh, you go see a wound, you see anything, or you take fluid from anything. And if there's a nasty smell, you know, you only need to go on diabetic fit rounds. So, you know, that's not a good sign. Um, and what do we need to think about before we do the um, thoracosynthesis and how do we do the thoracosynthesis? So two things to think about. So we normally do thoracosynthesis should be ultrasound guided. Um, that makes sense because there's risk to doing it. And um, um, you're putting a needle through right by the lungs. You don't want to cause a pneumothorax. Um, and then the other thing to think about before you're doing this again um, to think about is you're still doing a procedure. Is this patient on anticoagulation? That'd be something that the F1 might need to be thinking about um, before seeing if this patient was planned to have, you know, if they didn't manage to do, they want to do the thoracosynthesis tomorrow, do we need to stop that anticoagulation? Because they've seen a patient that they stop anticoagulation for, and also what are the risk benefits? What is the purpose we're doing this for? They stopped the anticoagulation because they were going to have this done the next day. And then the next day they thought they might've had a possible TIA. So really, um, unfortunately, a lot of these patients, if they're, um, you know, if they've got lung problems that might need to be done, if, you know, they've got COPD, then they're getting paranumonic um, infection. They might also have AF. So they're quite likely to be on anticoagulation. So do check, are they on anticoagulation? Do we need to hold this? What is the risk benefit? And obviously this is a procedure. A patient needs to be consented for this with the risks and benefits beforehand as well. So um, we've talked about that we would kind of one of our classic ways to investigate it next would be to do um, thoracosynthesis. Do we, what, um, so this is just a question about what, what we should do and I'll just get it up for you guys. Um, yeah, quite a lot of information. So I'll give you a minute and a half just to have a look at this and have a look at the chest x-ray as well. Okay, great. I'll just give you 20 more seconds.
10 more seconds. Okay, great. And I'll just show the results. So a bit of a split on what's going on here. So if we just talk through it quickly, so we've got a 68 year old man, he's got shortness of breath and tiredness. Um, we're very much getting a clinical picture. We've got pitting edema, we've got a raised JVP. So this is very much shortness of breath, tiredness, pitting edema, JVP. I hope what's running through your mind at this point is query heart failure, what is going on? We've then done us to percussion, decreased vocal resonance, just should be confirming for you. Okay, this sounds like pleural effusion. Then we've got some upper zone loans, some crackles. We've then got a past medical history that gives us um, a drug history, sorry, that gives us bisoprolol. So that's a beta blocker, ramipiril, an ACE inhibitor, a torvastatin, so that's a statin, and aspirin. This very much looks like medication that you would expect someone to be in who's um, got heart failure. This would be um, bisoprolol and ACE inhibitor. They were looking at um, prognostic driven medication, and we've also seen that they've got their on some secondary potential prevention such as a statin and aspirin so you know have they had an MI in the past or do you just have heart failure so that's all kind of fitting with our picture of heart failure when next information we say we've got is a chest x-ray so we have a look at the chest x-ray looking whether this fits whether there's anything acute that we need to rule out on this chest x-ray because you know someone can have a background condition but do they have something on top as well so look at this chest x-ray so we're going to just assume it's PA because we haven't been told whether it's AP or PA that heart looks a bit big to me I think more than 50 percent we've got quite a lot of kind of um I think we've got it, it, it all looks when when you're first don't say six sounds when you're first kind of looking it looks quite kind of you know almost messy in that top there you've got kind of um possibly some upper lobe diversion as well going on and then we've got this kind of um plurifusion like that just blunting of the diaphragm going on possibly there so this is all fitting with heart failure so we've decided that we've got someone who's got a heart failure and we know from our clinical signs that they've got what we think is a pleural effusion so what's the most ne appropriate next step um, and this is a tricky one but well done for those of you that said a furosemide infusion and the idea behind this is that um what we would try to do first is a there's a couple of reasons why this is the right answer first this patient is symptomatic i haven't given you their sats or how they're doing but we know that they've got this really raised gvp and we know that they're they're likely with these signs to be breathless and um, so we want to treat them and the other reason is if that you've got such a strong clinical pitch that's really pointing towards you towards heart failure you don't need to do your diagnostic for a chrysanthesis what you would do is trial treating that first and if that resolved you wouldn't need to do it because it's still a procedure have risk and benefits so the case where we wouldn't be needing to do it is when you've got heart failure and that's also because it's very common, very common cause. We don't want to be doing furocosynthesis as one of these patients if we can resolve it with furosemide and then we know, you know, that was what was contributing to it. Um, just going through why the others not so IV antibiotics um, although you might think probably before you'd seen that you might be throwing that in to be safe this isn't the most what's really needed to resolve this patient's seat and again sputum contrary we're not getting an effective picture though again it's often done to rule out a lateral check six way. And just the bottom one, it's raised about if you're starting someone on a furosemide infusion, what's it's really important to check and monitor? And um, feel free to put that in the chat or write down, just have 10 seconds to think about that. Okay, so we're starting someone on furosemide infusion. So we're doing that. And just to say furosemide is really great at removing when you're think, particularly thinking about fluid overload in the lungs because it moves, it, reabs it specifically helps with that as well as being a diuretic that uploads in the kidneys. So it's really, really great, really effective, going to make someone feel a lot less breathless. But um, it's still working on the kidneys. So a couple of things we need to monitor is we really need to monitor this patient use and ease because if um, the one time we're going to get into a tricky place is if their kidney function goes off, which is unfortunately very, very, common in patients with heart failure that they have problems with their heart and they often have problems in their kidney so we're often between a rock and a hard place and need to be balancing this so we need to be this patient needs to have daily use and ease with their being on a furosemide infusion and um, because if we start to get edfr of sort of 19 we're going to need to be holding that furosemide and then we're going to be getting our cardiac specialist and our renal specialist to kind of be discussing about how we can manage this patient it might need they need further support for that another thing that is easy to check and monitor whenever we're thinking about we need to really have an idea of this patient's fluid status because we're saying that they're fluid overloaded and we're going to start them on treatment for that so it's really important to be them monitoring and knowing they each day are and so what's going to kind of contribute to that we've already said we're going to have blood tests like using these really simple thing that people often forget to say in oskies that's really important to say though is daily weights you know that you can ask nursing colleagues 
to help with that. It's easy to do, it's not invasive, um, and it actually gives you an information. And if you can see that you're gradually reducing this patient's weight, you know that, great, our frizomide is working, we're offloading this patient, that's really good. And then the other third step is always gonna be by clinical assessment. It's gonna be making sure you regularly go and review, you check whether you see this JDP is raised, you check whether there's pitting edema. So great. So summary, if someone's got heart failure, it's clear heart failure, you can just treat them. You don't have to do a diagnostic for a cancer and think about furosemide. And whenever you're starting furosemide, make sure with the heart, thinking about the kidneys as well. And this is just to show you that not just to kind of give you the basis and the evidence before backing up. This is the diagnostic algorithm um, that was published in Forex. Um, and this is saying that, yes, yeah, so does the clinical prediction just translate? date, you know, have we got left ventricular failure? Have we got clear hypermobility? Can we just treat the cause? In the last case, yes, we could. Does it resolve? If it does, yes, perfect. We don't need to further investigate this. But then it's here. So if it doesn't resolve, that's when you're referring, you're getting your chest team involved. And that's when we're thinking about going for further investigation investigations and doing our fluorocosynthesis. Okay, so what do we send the pleuroaspirate for? We've, you know, we've decided this isn't heart failure, we're going to need to investigate it. Um, what do we send it for? And it's just useful, just put this in a list of five, have these, learn these, be ready to roll these up. And they're easy once we go through them later on, I think, and you know what each of them means and why you want to do them to remember. So if you're in an OSCE and someone asks you, you're able to rule out, you know, you want to make sure you're sending for protein, LDH, cytology, because that's going to, cytology tells us about cells, it tells us if there's a malignancy going on, pH, really useful, and then gram staying culture and sensitivity that might follow trust guidelines a bit when you send that for depending on because it is obviously expensive okay so um we've talked a lot about what causes the transdate we've talked a lot about what causes an exudate how do we tell them apart why is it useful we've kind of already said it's useful because we can immediately narrow down our differential and how we might want to go about treating this from them um i hope that's this familiar for lots of you but just to go back to the basics so what do we find in exudate we already talked about when we saw that diagram that's leaky and we've got local factors going on so we would be expecting to have protein and LDH, and we've, we've got local factors going on, such as we might have infection. When LDH is um, is an enzyme that's found in all cells, so if you've got cell death and breakdown, you're expecting more of that to be released. Um, so it, exudate, I think leaky, so I think protein. I then think, okay, local factors. I then think is there cell death going on? More like to have LDH. And then you also think about, is there going to be other stuff? You know, exudates are messy. That's how I think about them. So it might be white blood cells. There might be red blood cells. There might be bacteria. might even be malignant cells. If you really want to be sending this after lots of working out. And with an exudate, you really need to be knowing what the cause is particularly. And then... Um, we think about a transudate and transudate, I just think is much more simple. It's systemic factors. We talked about this hydrostatic, this was on cortic preta. I'm expecting not to be finding so much going on relatively in this pleurofusion when we look at it and we take it. I'm expecting much more stuff to be negative, much more similar to, um, yeah, not expecting so much protein, not expecting how to get. So that's what we can interpret what how we would tell it if we were going back to physiology that we discussed earlier and when we think about transudate versus exudate, exudate, local factors, messy, lots of things going on, protein and LDH. Whereas transudate, we're not really expecting those things. It's just force that is pushing it out or it's just a lack of protein that's causing stuff to grow out. So we've got that, obviously, this is great, but we've got this all formalized into the likes criteria, which is probably what you've heard of and what I just kind of like to know it back to the physiology, because I think if you're asked in an OSCE, you know, for the likes criteria, actually, it's very, very easy in that moment to forget it. Whereas if you know it based on the physiology, you can go back to your basics and um, explain it and kind of come to it. So if you're having that moment of panic, always think if it's based on knowledge of what causes it, that's much more helpful. So likes criteria, one of the things to always think is that the ratio is always fluid to serum fluid. And I think about as that you put what you're in, interested in and what you're investigating so we're investigating the chlorofluid so that's going to go first in our ratio and then we're comparing it to our blood as a bit of an idea of you know is this leaky or is it how does it compare is it mainly water that's moving out or other proteins as well so we talk about those ratios and i talked about protein and LDH being really important so we did the cutoff if there's more than half so we've got more than 0.5 um, that means that this is an exudate and that if you think about it, it makes sense because really if you're getting a transudate which mainly is pushing fluid out there should be a lot less proteins in that fluid than there should be um, in the blood where it's come from because we really shouldn't have them leaking out Versus if it's a local factor that's either making things leaky then we might still get a raised you know raised fraction of those we're getting more proteins leaking out 
again we talked about LDH if there's local factors going on so that's more than 0 0.6 or you can also use two-thirds upper limit of the normal. Um, so that's the specific criteria to think of and then the other thing a useful just kind of brief is thinking about if you've got more than 30 that's quite a lot of protein to be having think exudate as your approximation. So we've talked for a couple of minutes about what that, I'm just going to leave that there, try and kind of get it sorted in your heads that if you're having a moment of panic, you know what your lights criteria are, that you're feeling really confident with that. Again, if you want to ask any questions at this point, feel free to. Yeah, and I've just seen a couple of people answers. Um, really good job saying use and ease, absolutely. Potassium levels, absolutely didn't mention that, but definitely, sorry, this is going back to um, when we were talking about starting people on frizomide, absolutely want to be checking that and absolutely blood pressure on the chart and great, great answers. Would you expect to calculate this in OSCE? I don't think so. Um, if this was in a fourth year, I don't know exactly what spans for different things. I think probably the more likely, the way I've always seen it more likely, I think would come up as it would be, perhaps you were shown a pleurofusion on a chest X-ray and then asked to discuss it. Um, or if, um, you know, you they said, these were your examination findings. I think maybe in an SBA, they could ask you to calculate it. Um, but I think it's useful to just be kind of familiar with because it's not too hard to know. But no, I don't think sort of there and there on the spot. You're, they're not going to be wanting you to do kind of complicated math. So I don't think so. Not that it's complicated, but they're not going to be wanting you to spend time. Like, they want to know that you understand stuff and that you're safe in clinical practice. Okay. Great, so all that talk and someone asked if you calculate this. Well, you probably wouldn't have to do it hopefully in your um, OSCE, but we're gonna make you do it now just in case it comes up in a question and just to you know, consolidate learning. I'll just give you a minute to work that out. Have a go at this because you've consolidated stuff helps so much in remembering it. I'll give you just up to a minute. So just 30 more seconds. Okay, five more seconds. Okay, great. So we've got a bit of a split on this, but most people are right in going that this would be an exudate. Um, we're looking at that. And if you just calculate the ratios between these and you can just kind of look at it roughly, you're getting over your 50%. And the same with your LDH. Okay. Um, Okay, so just had a question with someone asking before we move on, why does less serum protein indicate transudate? So um, in the case it's transudate, um, that you can either try to just learn it intudate transudate, or what we're trying to go for the basis of intudate transudate, because you're not getting a leaky capillary um, wall. So you shouldn't, you normally have proteins in your blood. They're large. They shouldn't be able to move out into the pleural fusion um, unless you've got local factors going on. So that makes and when transudate, we're talking about systemic factors. So we're talking about these kind of pressure things. So it's much less likely that you get proteins leaking out. I hope that helps. Whereas if you're thinking about less serum protein, I think we're talking about, sorry, um, if you're talking about um, the pleural effusion protein, hopefully that answers. Let me know if that doesn't at all. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so does heart failure always cause a transudate? We've been saying earlier, um, yes, yes, yes. And absolutely, I want you to keep that in your mind. Absolutely, for exams, yes, yes, yes. Always causes a heart, a heart failure, always causes a transudate. Just a note for clinical practice, though, is that if someone's already on diuretic therapy, sometimes um, if it did end up getting investigated, it might look like an exudate. Um, because of the diuretics and how they kind of change that balance. But um, it's just always to relate back to the clinical picture. Um, so always think give this likely to be heart failure, but they won't give you that in exams. It's just kind of a life tip for looking. And if you see it on the wards, so you're not completely thrown. 
Okay, so we've talked about we've got a large number of causes of exudative pleuroeffusion. You know, we've talked about we've got malignancy, we've got infection, we've got um, inflammation, we've got, you know, if, is this rheumatoid arthritis? We've got loads of kind of stuff that feels a bit random. So how do we tell them apart? And this is where we really go into our further tests. There's lots of further tests that you can do. So we've talked about the protein, we've talked about the LDH. Cytology, we're going to go, I'm just going to go through all of these in a second of what they kind of mean and what they show us. But that's just a list to familiarize yourselves with. Okay, so I've got a question now here for you all. Let me try to bring it up for the poll. Um, yeah, and I'll give you a minute, uh, just over a minute for this because um, again, there's quite a lot of information to be having a look at. What do you think is going on? Great, so a couple of people answering. We'll give it 30 more seconds, but if you want more time, just message. Okay, great. So again, it's a bit more of a difficult one. We've got a bit more of kind of a split in what people are thinking, but well done for people who are thinking pneumonic pleurofusion. And we'll just go for it now so we're all on the same page of why. So let's just start with what we think from the beginning. So first we've got a 52 year old man, got a history of fever, night sweats, productive cough. Immediately what you're thinking when you're hearing this, whenever I hear fever, night sweats, productive cough, I'm thinking infection, I'm thinking nasty infection, you know, they're systemically unwell, they're getting this fever, they're getting night sweats, what's going on? We've then got this history of alcohol addiction that immediately raises for me, okay, you know, this is a potentially a vulnerable adult and they're vulnerable both in terms of their social situations and also in terms of um, what kind of infections they might be liable to get and also in terms of what kind of treatment, you know, and we already know that they've attended a &E, um, two weeks ago and and unfortunately, they haven't been able to receive the medical support that they need. So again, immediately you're hearing someone who might not ever be attended appointments. You're thinking of something that might develop more than potentially it should and might have developed onto having complications. We've then got our temperature, which fits with us having a fever and his SATs, which are low, worrying. Um, you know, there's a serious infection going on here. OK, so then we've got our chest x-ray. So let's move on to have a look at chest x-ray so quickly. We always do our ABCDE approach and just having a quick glance at this. And one of the big things that stands out if we look on our um, right heart border, if we've got this kind of het heterogeneous opacity, with even possibly some bronchograms as well seeing. So that sounds like a consolidation. So thinking that sounds like a pneumonia, which does that fit with our clinical picture? Because you should always be relating one back to the other. Yes, it does. Um, and then we've got our phoracosynthesis. We've got a cloudy appearance. Does that fit with it might be being infective? Yeah, absolutely. You know, same way with lumbar puncture when it looks a bit cloudy or thinking infective, same way. Something a bit funny is going on here. Then we've got our ratio. Um, and we know that this is um, an exudate because we've got, we to apply our likes criteria. This is more than 0 0.5. So we've got, a, it fits it on the protein criteria and it also fits it on our LDH criteria. So both of these were all thinking exudative. Does that again, relating that, does that fit to our possibly what we're clinically thinking on going on? Yeah, absolutely. So if we've got a paraneumonic pleural effusion, it would be exudative, we would fit that. Then we're giving one last piece of information, which is pH is 7.1. This is a really, really useful piece of information. A couple of reasons. So firstly, does it fit with being infection? Yes. So when you've got infection, you're thinking empyema or pleural effusions that are paranemonic and complicated, you're getting a pH dropping. This is a bad sign. So this all fits. So just going through that, this is a paranormal pleural effusion. So that's why the reason it wouldn't be heart failure is we'd be expecting a transudative that should be able to work that out both from the 
um, our protein ratio, we would expect that to be less than 0.5 and our LEH we'd also expect to be lower. Same with liver cirrhosis, we'd also expect that to be lower um, because it would be transudative. So we that kind of rules out those two. Then we were left with the last three and differentiating the last three I would make on the clinical picture. This sounds like, you know, he previously attended a &E two weeks ago with pneumonia, was untreated. He's probably got a slightly weakened immune system. Anyway, it progressed to be a paranumonic. But I can see why there might be some confusion with a malignant pleurofusion because um, that can also cause a low pH and so can just for reference esophageal rupture. So I hope that makes sense. Um, feel free to post any questions why we're getting a paranumonic. We've got clinical picture, chest x-ray fitting in with our phoracrocentesis. This is worrying. We've got 7.1 as our pH. Okay, now I've just bigger picture for anyone that was a bit small seeing that chest x-ray to just be able to see that consolidation going on there. Okay, so then we're gonna um, develop this question kind of moves on further and I'll just give you a minute um, to answer. There's two questions here, have a go at these. I'll give you a minute and a half of these because there's two. We kind of talked about together what might be going on. So hopefully that helps a bit. And the stem is the same as the stem we had for the past one. So you don't need to read it. It's just go, moving on now. Would we expect the glucose to be low? And what action is going to be needed for this patient? Fantastic, just 20 seconds left. Five seconds. Okay. Fantastic. So just showing this result, would you expect the glucose to be low? And well done to those of you that said yes. Um, and if we think about if we've got infection, a bit like um, what we were thinking about, um, a bit like the same as if you have lumbar puncture, the same as if you have anything, you know, if you've got a really nasty infection going on your glucose, you would expect to drop. So I always think about the bacteria, even though it doesn't happen in real, eating up all the glucose. Further action. Um, great that everyone everyone thought you need culture and specificity. Fantastic. Everyone thought antibiotics. Absolutely. This patient, though, is also going to need drainage. And that's because we've got this low pH. So this is a complicated paranumonic. It's not enough to just give in, um, antibiotics. We also need to drain it. And just to point out what's so missing that is so important about this patient's care and future management. Um, and just um, uh, for that, um, we need to, you know, we've got, we know that this patient has um, suffers from alcohol addiction. It's really important that this patient provides appropriate support. It's really important that they are, while they're in hospital, that they, if they're still drinking, that they are given for chlorodioxide to prevent them um, going into alcohol withdrawal and with future management that we are supporting them with this and continue to support them with this. Okay, this is just recapping when it's going over what we talked about in this question. So pH is low. Um, 7.2, complicated paranormal version, malignant disease, other things, esophageal rupture, which makes sense because if you're thinking you're getting acidic con content going into it, then it would, and then rheumatoid as well and malignant disease. Low glucose, just recapping, if it's less than 3.4, infection, malignancy, cancer, TB, and pyema. And again, rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is a bit rogue. Just remember it also having this being this other slightly rarer cause um, causing you to have these low things as well. Malignant pleurofusion, we talked that this and you'd want to be doing cytology on this, which would show your malignant cells would be beyond the scope of this lecture, but just um, make sure you familiarize yourself with those. And obviously we're going to be doing CT scans, histology for reports, just some of the common ones. You can get lung cancer, breast cancer, lymphoma, mesothelioma, ovarian gastric can also can be common causes of malignant pleurofusion. Okay, so white cell differential, um, I said that you can ask for that um, from when, what you send. And this is kind of going back to your general principles, which I hope building up and getting very, very, very familiar for everyone. So if we see neutrophils, we're thinking acute things. So we're thinking infection, pneumonia and pyema, sometimes bees. If we're seeing mononuclear or lymphocytes, we're thinking chronic. So we're thinking cancer, TB. Um, you can also get it after coronary artery bypass, but also the other thing to say, if anything's been going on for long enough, you'll probably see some of these cells as well. 
Eosinophils often are reaction to blood or air. So if there's a, um, a concomitant pneumothorax or hemothorax, and so that it's unlikely. So if you've got eosinophils, it's actually been found in studies to be inversely related to the, to the chance of it being cancer, but it can also occur in asbestosis or EGPA. So it's much more that kind of allergic -y picture. Amylase, um, all be familiar with amylase and pancreatitis. No surprise then that if you get a pancreatitis associated pleural fusion, your amylase is high. And the other thing that can cause it is again malignant tumors or esophageal rupture. And chylophorics, we talked about earlier, but just wanted to put a summary aside for you guys. If you get damage to the thoracic ducts, you can get that and you'd be expecting a high triglycerides and cholesterol, which makes sense because you've got damage to your lymphatic system. And this can be traumatic or non-traumatic. I don't think this is like as kind of high yield or common to go over. So kind of just put it in there for you guys to be aware of it more than anything. Okay, so we talked about what um, that we do diagnostic but what about, you know, do we ever drain for therapeutic? And that's a lot less commonly done for pleural effusions, partly because they're high risk. So if someone has a malignant pleural effusion that keeps reoccurring, actually we prefer not to com co complete, um, to continuously be putting stuff in because of the risks. And we want to be thinking about, unless they're really symptomatic, what, what, what else we can do. And um, you can also um, get the surgeons involved and think about doing, um, putting some talcum powders to actually sort of closing up that potential pleural space. Um, to make sure um, that it, instead of as that way to get it not reforming. Okay, um, great. So that was pleurofusions we focused on. We're probably not going to have time, but I'll just blitz through a couple of things about ascites just where I can show the common things, um, but we'll probably have to stop in the next kind of 10 minutes, just kind of give that a run through. And we can always, if people want, put it in a future session or give the slides and people can have a look over in their own time. So just quickly ascites. So we're talking about abnormal buildup. So we before we were talking about pleurofusions and normal buildup in between in the pleura. Now we're talking about abnormal buildup of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. You can get, as you can see in the picture, get this distended abdomen that is painful Painful. You can also get splinting off the diaphragm. That's basically, you know, diaphragm really needs to move to facilitate breathing. If you've got all this fluid and it's really tense, your diaphragm can't. So not surprisingly, people have some trouble breathing. Signs, you've got abdo distension, shifting dullness and positive frill test. Okay, investigations you want to do is FBC, LFT, COAG, use knees. You want to be thinking of doing ultrasound and then paracentesis, which is basically the afternoon version of thoracocentesis, which makes sense. So paracentesis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on for um, if people can post in the chat, if they'd rather just leave this to next time or um, if they want me to kind of blitz through this. I'll keep blitzing until I hear the horizon of the medstop team. But what I'll do is if I'll get one, OK, carry on, fab. But if one of the medstop team just post the feedback in case anyone has to leave and if you could fill that in, that'd be really grateful because kind of base these sessions on what is helpful for you guys. Okay, um, so um, yeah, so if one of the medstop team want to share the, yeah, well, thank you. Um, so paracentesis, so again, how we talked about before paracentesis that we look at the fluid, same thing with paracentesis. Um, and the thing is, you don't always have to do this ultrasound guided because if you think about instead of having the lungs where you've got this quite small space, when you see that, that image that we saw on the last slide, we've got this very distended abdomen. You can imagine you can kind of stick a needle in there with lots lower using shifting dull tests to, to work out where it becomes dull. You can be fairly confident that you're going into fluid. So it's a lot a less risky in terms of that sense. So we can sometimes do it without the ultrasound guided. Again, recommend that you try see this. Again, so this is just to kind of transfer that how if you learn about pure effusions, it's helpful. Same thing, you know, Firstly, look at the colour that comes out. Is it straw coloured, which would be normal? Is it mil milky? We're thinking limp, cirrhosis. If, is there a bit of blood? We're thinking malignancy or also traumatic. Okay. Um, and when do we do paracentesis? Um, so we shouldn't, again, um, we want to be thinking about when we're doing any of these investigations. So if this is a new onset, if we, this person hasn't been known to have ascites before, absolutely, we should do it. If this patient has ascites, but they start to get worse, we need to be doing it because we need to know what is going on, has something changed? If they have some GI bleeding, we need to be doing it because they're high risk of SVP. And if we've got any labs that are showing infection, again, we need to be doing this. And this is all linked to the being because the difference between this is it's really important to be using paracentesis to rule out spontaneous bacteria peritonitis. Okay. So instead of we talked about um, with our pleurofusions that we use transudate, exudate, and we use that. 
instead, because ascites is so much so commonly caused by cirrhosis, and that would be if you're ever to guess blindly at what is the cause, I would always be going for cirrhosis because it's most so much the most common cause. But because of that, actually, the diagnostic test that we use is focused on basically differentiating, you know, is this caused by cirrhosis and portal hypertension, so that's hydrostatic pressure, or is it caused by kind of everything else? So for doing that, we just need the serum ascites albumin gradient. And something to be aware of how you calculate this is it's just minor things. It's really easy to calculate. Just the albumin ascites minusing the ascites albumin, sorry, the serum ascites minus um, the ascites albumin concentration. And the cutoff that we use is if you have a high serum albumin ascites gradient, then we say that is hydrostatic pressure. I'm going to go over this a second. And so if it's high, it's confirming what the test is looking for. We've got hydrostatic pressure, we've got high portal hypertension, and we've got cirrhosis most likely going on, or we've got some cause of high portal um, hypertension. If we've got a low gradient, then we're looking at we've got an, uh, something else. So we talked about this high serum, hydrostatic pressure, which remember if we talked about earlier, that's basically saying we've got high blood pressure and, and thinking about in terms of the, um, that we've got portal hypertension. And that's that forcing out of that same diagram before. And just remember the number 11 or 1.1, depending what numbers you're using. Um, and so we talked about, basically we do this, we get it more than 11. We know that it's portal hypertension. What are the causes of that? They can be split into pre -synoodle sinusoidal, so splenic or portal vein, sinusoidal or post-sinusoidal. But by far the most common is cirrhosis. Other things that you might think about would be like the thrombosis and bud chiari, but by far, far the most common is looking at cirrhosis. Okay, and the only other thing is to differentiate if you saw that heart failure was also in that list is if you get more or less than 2.5. So in heart failure, you can get, because it's, um, released and um, because it's um you can sometimes get a bit higher whereas in cirrhosis we're talking about you know scarring and thickening it's a little bit less permeable so you normally don't get as much protein that's just used to differentiate um, I'm going to stop once I go over just this last little bit um so um we talked about this gradient so um again I talked about so if it's low serum ascites albumin gradient less than 11 that's caused by local factors again like we we're thinking before or in this case, low serum albumin. So common causes, malignancy, infectious diseases, pancreatitis, connective tissue, SLE. Okay, um, just a quick question for you all. Okay. What is the most likely diagnosis? And give you, just give you a minute for that. Yeah, great. And um, so just give you 15 more seconds. 10 more seconds. Okay. Okay, great. And just share those results. So the first thing we want to do is we talked about the serum albumin ascites gradient. So let's calc. Sorry, let's take it always the way we do ISPA. So we've got 59 year old woman with abdominal dorsentious and tenderness, and she drinks a bit, but that's not really that much, is it? And she's also got this family history of breast cancer. Then we go to our sort of hard facts for what we want to be working out. We go to our serum albumin ascites gradient. Quickly looking at that, we're subtracting one from the other. We can see there's a difference of seven. Does that meet our cutoff as 11? No. So it's not not more than 11 so it's not to do with high portal pressure so immediately we're ruling that out that means when we look at these options again so we've not got high portal pressure we're not therefore thinking about cirrhosis we're not therefore thinking about alcoholic liver disease and actually eight units is the modest amount she's not drinking loads that we would be expecting though again good to remember how accurate is alcohol history um 
The next thing is we've got less than 250 cells. So we are not thinking about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which we'll go over in another session. So putting this all together is actually, we've got a, a woman with abdominal distension and we know that ovarian cancer can present late and is common. So in this case, this is ovarian cancer. But again, you would be doing further investigations. You'd be doing an ultrasound looking at this is so you might think about another cancer might possibly cause it but um again any of the options that basically as long as we weren't picking alcoholic liver disease which we know we would expect to have um a higher serum albumin um ascites gradient then i think all of those are reasonable guesses so investigations this is just to show it's quite similar to some of the investigations that we do for pleural effusions other things to note it's really 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 important can't stress this enough inside fluid to get your cell count differential because neutrophils is what we need to exclude we need to be excluding in almost everybody they don't have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis because it is a medical emergency um i'll just leave this as the last poll that we're going to do last question I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Just give you 40 more seconds. Okay, 20 more seconds. Ten more seconds, feel free to give it a go. Great, and we'll end the poll there, and I'll just share the results with everyone. So we take this again to our normal approach. We go first spot info. So we've got a 56-year-old man, we've got abdosension, and we've got pain. Okay, so that kind of fits with ascites, painful, distended. We've got drinking 50 units of alcohol. This is very different to the person that we were seeing before. This is a large amount. This should be worrying. We've also got a 36 pack year history. So if you're seeing this patient in GP, you want to be fully assessing them and engaging them in both these. Then we go on to our tap. So now we've got 23 minus seven. That's a lot higher than our 11, just looking at that. So if we're higher than 11 or serum album and CITES, um, gradient, we're thinking, okay, um, this is portal hypertension. So we're thinking about one of our causes of portal hypertension. We are then going to think about what might be the cause. We've already kind of got a common cause. We've got alcohol. So we're thinking cirrhosis likely to be caused by alcohol. And if you think back to Arden's session on LFTs, that's a common cause of causing cirrhosis. We've ruled out spontaneous bacterial peritonitis because we've got less than 250. That's great. And now we're going to think about how we need to manage this. So they've already put in the drain. They've drained some fluid. It's great. They've started Pabronex. So that's because this person has alcohol history. We need to make sure we're looking at making sure we're retasting their um, B vitamin B deficiencies. And also we've started them to make sure on chlorodiazole peroxide finally alcohol withdrawal. Then what is the most appointment treatment? This is just something to really learn about is well done for those of you that went for spironolactone and 200 milliliters, 20% human albumin solution. So we want to give diuretics to help um, offload this. Um, and it's really important if you're coming on to the night that you're following the day team's plan with these patients and not giving them other fluids because it's really important that these are managed properly. And we give the, the human albumin solution to reduce the hepatorenal syndrome and SBP risk, which we'll go over in another session. So just giving you that, how do we manage ascites if we've got this high SAAG caused by portal hypertension cirrhosis? And it's doing this sodium restrict and spironolactone diuretics. And then also thinking about human album solution. So we're going to pull the session to on terms of content that we're covering to close there because I know we've been going on for quite a while um, and we can leave it for another session to go over the rest. But if people could fill in feedback, that would be really, really appreciated. And the other thing to say is we're doing a rapid review session on Thursday where we're going to go through some respiratory investigations. We're going to go through also some abdo, some cardiac, um, as well as some surgical. And we'll be going through them rapid fire, um, kind of SBA, and then talking through those. Um, and then 
Um, the other thing, we're flexible to, we've got a load of questions of stuff that we think is core, cool, but where we spend the time. So if you want to, um, there's also going to be posted a link on look out on our Facebook page for what you particularly would like to cover. And we can make sure that it's as useful for you guys in your upcoming exams. So thanks very much.